Hello, everyone. Um, so now we will talk about a different type of potential energy, specifically a spring mass potential energy. So what is a spring mass? Um, there's a little uh, animation here. So it's literally a mass attached to a spring. And, you know, if you were in the physical discussion lab, you would um, have those hanging around the room and you could play with them. But um, I'm sure you have as played with things like this in your life. It's um, so it's a mass that if left alone, it would just be hanging there. But then if you pull it away from its kind of natural hanging position, which we call equilibrium, then it would start oscillating up and down. So whether it's vertical or horizontal, it would have the same type of behavior. So this kind of should be attached. Um, so the energy which is contained in this spring mass system when it is moved away from equilibrium is what is known potential energy. So kind of like with gravitational energy, potential energy, when we moved an object up and let it go, it gave it motion. So that potential energy, gravitation potential energy was converted to kinetic energy. Here, if you take the spring mass, and you pull it away from equilibrium and let it go in a very similar way that uh, spring potential energy now, or sometimes we call it spring mass, potential energy now gets converted to kinetic energy, allowing the system to oscillate. So again, this potential energy is the energy of position, the same way it was for gravitational potential energy, except um, it, here I wrote SP, but it, um, you know, you could, we could just, you could just use S for spring or SP, or sometimes we see SM, you know, so there, there are different uh, subscripts you can use to indicate this uh, spring mass potential energy. Um, but what's important is what is the indicator? So how can you tell when uh, your system has non-zero spring mass potential energy. And in this case, so we remember for gravitation, potential energy was just height. So the higher an object was away from the center of the earth, the greater was its gravitational potential energy. Here, the indicator is the displacement from equilibrium. So what that means is just the distance from its equilibrium position. So every spring mass has its natural distance where when left alone, it would naturally sit there. So you can imagine taking a spring and a mass and hanging it and letting it go. Eventually it settles at this uh, position, whether it's vertical or horizontal, it has this equilibrium position. At equilibrium, there's no potential energy. But as soon as you move it away from equilibrium by some distance x, here the absolute value actually has a lot of meaning because uh, what it means is that it doesn't matter wh where you, whether you stretch the spring or compress it by the same distance x, although you, you might want to define stretching like a plus x displacement and compressing a minus x, it's really only the distance from equilibrium, so the absolute value of x that, that matters. Um, it, so whether you're stretching it or compressing by that same distance, you're giving it uh, the same type of potential energy. And the way you can think about it is if you take a, if you look at the system, whether you stretch it or let it go, compress it, let it go, it would result in the same type of motion. So the direction is not important in a sense like, uh, is it moving away or towards from equilibrium? It's just that distance that matters. <clears throat> okay. So what is the equation? Actually, it looks kind of similar to our kinetic energy equation. Um, this has to do with the square, and it has to do with the fact that the direction doesn't matter. So it goes as a square of this x. This x, again, is that distance from equilibrium. So we always measure it relative to the equilibrium position. Also, kind of a subtle thing, and if you want to look more deeply into it, you can uh, read in the Libertex explanation. But when we're dealing with a vertical spring mass, although as it oscillates, 
it does change in height, we do not include gravitational potential energy. And the reason for that is a little bit subtle. And again, you can refer to the book, but the main reason is that we define the equilibrium position when um, this ball is, um, or you know, the mass attached to the spring is hanging already due to the effect of gravity at some location. So gravity is kind of indirectly already included when the equilibrium position is defined. So again, for spring masses, when they're vertical, we do not consider gravitational potential energy as long as this mass is attached to the spring. Okay, so there's this factor of one half. So what is this K? So K is a constant that has to do with the physical property of the actual spring. And it basically what it does is it measures the stiffness. So there's all kinds of springs uh, around, you know, this one, the way it looks, it looks quite stiff, but you can imagine a much less stiff one. Um, so why should the potential energy be proportional to the stiffness? Well, just think about the amount of work. So let's look actually at the next. Uh, so the, I, I'll have a, in two slides, there will be a more direct explanation of this, but if you think about the amount of work that's required to stretch a spring by a certain amount, the more stiff the spring is, the harder it will be to stretch it. So the more energy you need to add to that spring. So that's why it's proportional to K. All right, so here it's just uh, what I already, depicts what I already kind of said, the fact that uh, what matters is that distance from equilibrium. So whether you're compressing it by some distance, here it's Y because it's vertical, but we typically just use a letter X because all you really care about is that distance from equilibrium, whether it's vertical or horizontal. So here's an example of the spring being compressed. This is at equilibrium. What is the displacement at equilibrium? Zero. So potential energy is zero at equilibrium. And here we have, again, a potential energy, which is non-zero when the spring is stretched. Okay, so let's apply, again, our energy conservation ideas, but now to this spring mass situation. So imagine um, this dashed line, again, represents the equilibrium position if the mass was just left alone, but this girl now takes the mass and um, which is attached to the spring and then pulls it down by some distance. So what is the interval of the physical situation we want to study? So our physical system is a spring mass. We start at equilibrium and then we end, um, you know, using the letter H here, doesn't matter, at some final like height away from equilibrium or, or that distance uh, from equilibrium. So imagine that she takes uh, the mass and just pulls it down and holds it there. So initially the speed is zero, final speed is zero. So this is very analogous. If you wanna go back a couple of uh, lectures and take a look at the situation of someone lifting a heavy box uh, and that helped us figure, figure, make the connection between the gravitational potential energies wor and work. Here we're trying to make a connection between the uh, spring mass potential energy and, and work. So again, we're ignoring kinetic energy for now, just thinking about how much work is required to um, stretch the spring. So potential energy goes up because the displacement uh, goes up, we start at zero, we end up with some non-zero value. What does that tell us? That tells us that work needed to be done on the system, that you had to exert a force um, in the direction of the motion of that ball. Um, how, do, how much work exactly? Well, we use this equation. Uh, here's the uh, expression for the spring potential energy. It's one half K delta X squared. What does that mean? It means x final squared minus x initial squared. And because x initial is zero, we just end up with one half k x final squared is work. So what does this tell us? The farther we stretch it, the more work it, it takes. And also it goes as x squared. So what that means is that as you stretch it more and more, it gets harder and harder. Um, because it's 
it's a quadratic rather than a linear relationship. And also here is that uh, spring constant, which is uh, related to the stiffness of the spring. Again, it tells us that when the spring constant is large, so the spring is really stiff, it would require more work to stretch it by some given distance x. <clears throat> All right, so let me ask you a question to think about this. So now let's think about not just stretching it and how much work it's required. Now imagine you've done that, put that work into the system and have stretched it, but now you let it go. And now you're allowing this mass to oscillate up and down. Here's um, this equilibrium marked here. Now it's at some distance away. Equilibrium, those errors just mean it's gonna go up and down. So the question is, for an oscillating spring, the maximum speed is at. So where is the location as it oscillates up and down where you think the speed should be maximum? So pause the video, think about it, think about conservation of energy here. And let's look at the answer. <clears throat> so it's gonna, the answer is at equilibrium. So again, we're applying, um, I suggest you go back to the pendulum example and you can make very direct connections between that example where we had kinetic energy. Go, uh, you start with maximum potential energy and then at the bottom it's minimum, maximum kinetic energy, then it slows down and goes back to maximum potential energy. So there was this transfer between gravitational potential energy and kinetic potential energy. And here it's the same thing except it's the spring mass, potential energy, and kinetic energy. So we start at some distance, let's say that maximum displacement before you let it go. So all the energy is potential. As it moves back to equilibrium, at equilibrium, the potential energy goes to zero. So given that the total energy has to stay constant, we're assuming this is a closed system, we're neglecting friction, any such effects. So right here at equilibrium, potential energy is zero, which tells us that all the energy has to be kinetic. As it moves away, now it's starting to slow down and slowly convert its kinetic energy back to that maximum potential energy. And then it repeats over and over as it oscillates. So again, if you look at it, either think about it in terms of the total energy, which is staying constant. So, um, the speed or the kinetic energy must be maximum when this one is zero, which is at equilibrium. Or if you think about it in terms of changes, uh, when we go, let's say from here to here, that's gonna be the biggest change of potential energy going to zero. So that has to uh, result in the biggest change of kinetic energy. All right, so this is all for this segment. In the next uh, slide, I'm gonna start actually considering effects of friction. So we're gonna now merge mechanical um, and friction has to do with thermal energies. So whenever there's friction, you're rubbing two things against each other. There's gonna be uh, things, these uh, objects are warming up. So there's thermal energy. So we're gonna now look at transfers between mechanical and thermal energy or not now, but in the, in the next uh, video. Thank you for listening.